And we're back with some more RimWorld. And yes, this is the DLC. It is the Biotech DLC, and it looks sweet. Now, this is not a review by any means. It's just I want to have a look at some of the mechanics and some of the things they've introduced and basically answer a whole bunch of questions that I had that I think are good to know about this. First up, when it comes to making a new colony, they've introduced a couple of new starts. There's the Mechantor and the Sangophage. Basically, you can either start as a vampire or some guy who controls mechanoids. You're the Mechanoid Whisperer or you're a bloodlusting vampire. Now, both of these starts are fine, but you can't, you don't need to actually start this way to end up with a, a mechantor and a, a vampire. You can just do a normal start. In fact, let's just go with, say, a Lost Tribe here and have a quick look at what happens when you try and fire one up. When you get to the Create Character screen, everything's going to look the same, except for this bit over here on the right. You've got your baseliners and randomize an adult. What this means is the type of pawn they spawn as. So normally you'd spawn as a regular baseline human that has no real characteristics or changes. But you could say pick a dirt mole. Yeah, let's and that's this sh changes this over here. Their xenotype is now changed to dirt mole. If we click on it, we can see they have all of these extra little genome things stuck in here. This is all the introduction of the the biotech expansion. So they have fast wound healing, meaning they heal their injuries twice as fast. However, they're a slow runner. What this is actually does is it forces them all to have the slow poke trait. So if you spin these as much as you want, you can see this blue slowpoke, it never goes away no matter what pawn it is. This is one of the introductions as well. You can actually have traits that are hard-coded to happen because of your, your germline xenotype. Then you've got they hate sunlight because they're mole people. They're strong in melee. They have uh, oh, grey eyes. Sand, like these, these ones here don't really count. They don't actually increase complexity or do anything to a pawn. They just make sure... It just means that all of them will have similar hair colour. It's a, it's a way of making us like them more. We'll associate certain gene types with certain traits in our playthroughs. It'll... It should be weird. Well, that's my theory, anyway. Then you've got their nearsighted, which actually makes them terrible at accuracy. So they, they are terrible with close combat weaponry. So you can see they're kind of pushing these to be a close combat focused melee damage dealer. Like, I mean, a melee damage bonus of 50% is incredible. That means, like, if you get them Zeus hammers, they will one-shot most humans, like, just instantly. Dark vision means they're not affected by working in the dark and removes the darkness negative, meaning you can just, like, put these guys in the dark underground uh, have lots of strong melee blocking, hold people up at choke points, and you're just going to have a great time, basically. However, there's a few differences here. Let's look at a completely different one, the Hussar. Hussar is basically a genetically engineered soldier. Now, uh, they've got super fast wound healing, they're psychically deaf, they're tolerantly hot and cold, they're resistant to toxins, they're hyper-aggressive, which is actually bad in many ways. This, this means they call, they're three times as more likely to cause social fights. Uh, mental breaks are always violent, and they break out of prisons far more often, you know, so th there's not... There's some bad stuff in here. Uh, also, they have reduced pain, which means they're more likely to get themselves killed instead of going down. Uh, red eyes is actually built into this as well. So if you see someone with red eyes, they're, they're a super soldier. You, you don't want to mess with them. They're unstoppable, meaning they don't stagger. You can shoot them, stab them, do anything like that. It doesn't slow them down. So they can close to combat distance or run to cover without getting stopped, but from a shot hitting them. That's... I don't know how popular that would be with me, but that does seem nice. Great at shooting. Now this is, um, okay, there's a whole bunch of these great at traits. So you can be great at shooting, melee, crafting, farms, animals, you know, whatever, you name it. All the traits you have, even including social. And there's two different variants of it. The great version gives you plus eight. This is the best one. It gives you plus eight, but it also gives you a burning passion. So if we pick a Hussar here, you'll see they, uh, they always have a passion in shooting in melee. Doesn't mean they have a double burning passion, just that, but they will always at least have a single passion in it. So it's impossible for them not to get it. You can engineer a race that always has a passion for something. That's kind of incredible. They're also awful at plants, animals, artistic, social. That means they will always have a negative eight in that. And finally, this one, actually, before we go on to the, the final one, which I think is amazing. This uh, awful or great is added after their normal skill level. So for example, this one here has 19 in melee. Their actual level though is 11, but the plus eight they're getting is added on top of that. It means if they start learning, at uh, whatever it is, melee, their melee skill will go from 11 to 12, but in reality they'll be going from 19 to 20. So in other words, just say this pawn only had a zero skill in melee to start, and you have plus 8 because of the great melee gene, they'll learn their first few skill points as if they were level 0. So it doesn't actually add to the difficulty in learning, meaning you'll probably have these guys at 16 to 20 shooting in no time, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think they can go above the 20 cap. Maybe, we'll, we'll have to check that out. Anyway, oh, and also psychically deaf, but... No, no, this one here, this one here is incredibly juicy. So, go juice dependency. This means they have to take go juice, or they go into a coma and die if they don't, right? That would seem like a problem, except for the fact that they're immune to go juice addiction. And I don't know about overdoses. I don't think they can, but we'll, uh, we'll see. But that means you've got a pawn that can take go juice without the risk of ever getting addictions. 
Sure, you'll have to feed him go juice once every five days. Who cares? By mid-game, that's not a problem. Meaning you can have troops that you can definitely go juice regularly. It basically takes go juice from being a risk of addiction, which is a problem, to, yeah, these people just take go juice regularly. Uh, in fact, there's a whole xenotype editor. Now, now don't panic. Don't panic. We're not going to go through all of these. Honestly, it would take far, far, far too long. I just want to go through some of the fun ones. Like, oh, uh, psychite dependency. You know what? Let, let, let's show you uh, a few ways you can change things. For example, we could make someone who breeds fire. Yep, this pawn will now be able to breed fire. However, you'll notice down here their metabolic efficiency went down. Every time you add on good stuff, it increases their hunger rate. And you can only go up to metabolic plus five. So if we say do that, and we're going to give them uh, animal war call. This gets them to a hunger rate of 225%, but we can't go any higher. Minus five metabolic rate or 225% hunger is as good as you can go. If you try and go any higher than that, it will stop you. Uh, let's see, let's give them super immunity. No. Let's give them very fast runner. Very fast runner is fun because it makes them a, a jogger. They'll just be a jogger by default, but that costs five points, which puts you way over the cap. So we could get these two abilities or we could get very fast runner. Some of them have been quite priced quite highly. But what you can do is you can put on negative ones. Like you can give yourself weak immunity, which means you recover from diseases more slowly, uh, but and that will reduce your, your cost. So by giving yourself some bad traits, you can counteract the good ones you're giving. So you could basically make pawns that are very specific. Like you could have a, a slow moving pawn with lots of toughness on them. So they're just an absolute tank or something like that. But you're going to have to balance things out. There's no such thing as, as a free lunch. There will be negatives you're gonna have to build into your pawns. But let's have a look at some of the good ones. The first up ones I want to look at is these ones down here that are uh, addi uh, addict resistant and addict immune. Now addict resistant I wouldn't be interested in, but addict immune is fun. That means they can use them without ever having a chance of getting addicted. However, they're expensive. They're, they're, they're going to cost you five points, which is a lot. However, having say a dependency on something actually gives you four points to play around with. And if you go above the point requirements you need, you actually reduce your hunger rate, meaning it takes less nutrition to keep your pawn going. Honestly, not really a big deal. Come on, it's just food. But this does mean you can do things like have someone who is go juice dependent and let's say wake up dependent, meaning they have to take wake up, they have to take go juice and they're immune to getting addicted to both of them, meaning they can take wake up just all the time and go juice. Well, not all, all the time. There's still the, the chances of uh, overdose, I presume, but they're pretty much immune to this and you can just use them frequently. And that gives you a whole bunch of metabolic efficiency points to play around with to put on even more stuff. I love it. I love this whole idea. It's like a nice balancing act between, well, this would be handy to have, but uh, do we really want to push it too far? And yes, 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 we do. All right. This is aptitudes. And this is basically comes down to you need to be awful at shooting, poor at shooting, strong at shooting, or great at shooting. The wonderful thing about this is you can custom build pawns to be like just absolute monsters at something. So they could be great at shooting, um, great at intellectual and crafting, but then terrible at everything else. So they can be terrible at farming and plants and all that. There's a great ways to engineer a pawn, but most of these are pretty much self-explanatory. The only thing you really need to know is having a the great end or the high end one, which costs you three metabolic efficiency, yet that gives you a, a, a passion, a single passion in whatever that skill is, which allows you to engineer people. Like you could find a terrible pawn who's terrible at, or a great pawn who's great at crafting skills. Like they've got the traits for it, but they don't actually have any passion in it. And you could genetically engineer them to be great or to have a, a bonus to crafting. It's mad. Smooth tail increases the manipulation of a pawn. And elongated fingers uh, increases the manipulation of a pawn. You might want to give this to a crafting species to make them really good at it. Um, Unstoppable pollution stimulus I haven't played around with, but this one basically makes you better when you're exposed to pollution, which is a, a, a trait they've introduced or a, a stat they've introduced in the game. We're not going to get too deep into that one. It, uh, there's still a lot up in the air. But these ones are fun. See, robust digestion. This means you can eat raw food and get the same nutrition out of it as if it was cooked, meaning you don't need to cook at all. Strong stomach means you're immune to food poisoning. Combine the two, which the pig race in this game currently has, and you've got a race that can eat raw food, never gets any... Uh, never gets any food poisoning from it and also gets a nutrition bonus, meaning it's just like they've eaten cooked food and you don't need to cooking. You don't need to cook. You can just have everyone eating raw food, no cooking required. Interesting, but that seems like an expensive spend. Now these two are a bit weird. They've got the mild cell instability. This is fun in that uh, it gives you some points to play around with, but only two, but it reduces your lifespan it triples your chances of cancer and reduces your immunity, immunity gain speed, which I would hate to mess with. You, you lose out on an immunity gain speed and uh, your, your colonist dies to some disease, so that seems bad. Major cell instability makes it even worse. I would probably not really play around with these, and I think they're probably going to be nerfed or tweaked in some ways. Inbred is a genetic condition affecting a person's fertility, immunity, and mental capacity. This is just all bad, and it forces the trait slow learner on them. As far as I can tell, it might be if you too closely breed some of your pawns. So that's something to avoid, I would say. 
Then you got a whole bunch of cosmetic stuff, hair color, skin color, uh, body type. You can, yeah, you can have people who have a heavy jaw, just genetically speaking, or a center horn. Yep, yep, they got a center horn in their head. Doesn't cost anything, it's just genetically how they're going to be. So you could tie these with certain traits if you wanted to for fun. Here's an interesting one. You can genetically engineer staggeringly ugly people all the way up to beautiful people if you want. Um, there's some fun ways you can combine this with other traits. We'll come back to that. But then you've got like your fertile, sterile, high libido, low libido. Uh, this one's amazing. Robust. Incoming damage multiplier by 75%. That's incredible. That means all of your pawns can become tougher and avoid getting one shot or more likely to avoid getting one shot. Or you could make them delicate. And I think they take about 15% more damage if they're delicate. It's a forced trait as well. Uh, the delicate one. Now the extra pain is interesting because if you genetically splice in extra pain, all the people of that gene line will have the wimp trait going down almost instantly, which would be fun to make a race of wimps to fight against because they just fall over every time you even tap them. You wouldn't be able to kill most of them, they just fall over from the pain, which would make them great, you know, like as the slave species or something, which is a terrible thing to actually say out loud. But yeah, there, there's some really nasty stuff you can do in this game. Uh, also, there's very sleepy means you like this one, I think would be horrible. Your sleep rate, they'd have to sleep more, which seems nasty. That was a huge negative to have. But you've also got all the way up to never sleeps and disable the need for sleep. Personally, I'd never go that way. Getting rid of sleep gets rid of too many bonuses, gut loving, uh, room bonus, all of that stuff. Like All of that good stuff would go away. So I probably wouldn't advise that. But low sleep might be handy. Then you've got this violence level. You can literally genetically program in violence. One, The one I find most interesting here is kind instinct. This actually forces the trait kind onto a pawn. And it only costs one point, right? And if you remember down here, we had... How would you like some ugly pawns? Say, staggeringly ugly. So you could genetically engineer a race of kind, staggeringly ugly pawns. And they wouldn't care that all of their, their teammates are staggeringly ugly. Because the kind overwrites all social negatives. So you could have a kind pawn. Like, all your pawns would be kind. Everyone would be ugly. But because they're all kind, they don't mind. Socially, it would be a, a non-issue. So there's ways you can tweak this to do really fun stuff. Or you could have it so that they're completely non-violent. That's actually a, uh, that, that gives you points to play around with, so if you make a non-violent pawn. Yeah, they've actually priced this about reasonable, but again, you could genetically engineer this onto people who you're going to keep as slaves or stuff like that, so it's, there's some nasty stuff going around here. Strong melee, incredible. This makes making an entire build around strong melee pawns possible. You could just make an entire team and they'll get a 50% bonus to their melee damage. You can have weak melee just to get some free points back, but I would never do this. I mean, losing half your melee damage for one point? No, never. Hyper aggressive. This one's interesting. Increases your social fight chances. Mental breaks are always violent and increases prison break interval. These are not people you want to be keeping in a prison. In fact, recruiting them is probably going to be pretty hard. Uh, also, aggressive is similar, but slightly less. Dead cam seems to be that even Steven one. We'll never do social fights. Mental breaks are never violent and will never prison break. This is sort of like just they're, they're very calm very even keel and kill thirst is the other end of the spectrum where yeah they, they basically got to kill people or they get unhappy oh now uh, where's this one yes tox immunity toxic resistance we haven't really played around with the toxic stuff in this but this can give you immunity to poison gas pollution stuff like this i'm thinking this could be interesting if you want to just uh, pollute your entire map and turn it into a horrible hellscape that the only thing that can survive on it is your people might be interesting uh, mild UV sensitivity basically reduces your movement speed in sunlight and gives you a minus six mood if you're in sunlight for a nice bonus in like, free points. Uh, then you've got intense UV sensitivity, which reduces your movement and gives, makes you even more unhappy. This might be good if you're on a sunblocker tile. It would give you a whole bunch of free points to play around with. In interesting to see. Fire resistant and tinder skin are basically the opposite of each other. This one makes you resistant to fire. This one makes you take four times as much damage from fire. And then there's pyrophobia, which means you have a mental break if you, you're, you can have mental breaks if you're standing near fires. That's bad. Really, 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 really bad. Then you've got ones that affect how, you, how tolerant you are to cold or heat. Honestly, pretty much self-explanatory. Then you can have everything from depressive, pessimist, optimist, or sanguine hard-coded into your pawns. And the thing is, you can't take both. For example, if you kick in two of them, one of them will get disabled. Uh, so you can see your depressive is active, active and sanguine is, is disabled. And it doesn't matter what order you put them in, I don't think. Yeah, depressive will always take over. So there seems to be a hierarchy. So if you put in optimist and sanguine, uh, sanguine is suppressed because it's further down the tree. It seems to be a left to right thing, but uh, honestly, I haven't done too much in detail in this. But yeah, that's very interesting because you can just buy an extra bunch of mood points for your pawns if you're willing to spend the points. And it's only two points. That's... Quite nice. Anyway, slow runner makes you a slow poke. Fast runner makes you a fast walker. Very fast gives you jogger, but that is incredibly expensive. I'm not sure I'd be wanting that. Naked speed is interesting. This one is actually gives you points to play. Uh, actually increases your hunger rate, which is bad. 
But so long as you're, um, actually no, it decreases your hunger rate, which is good. But if you're wearing clothes, you move slower. If you're not wearing clothes, you move faster. I think I, like for two points, the slight movement speed bone negative. I mean, you could make a slow poke race of slow people and just make them incredibly tough and use the extra points to do stuff with. It would might be interesting. Well, never mind. Moving on, psychic bonding. This means romance attempts always succeed. Gain psychic bond with first romantic partner. This means if they try and bond with someone, it will work. That could be good or bad. That could be really good or really bad, depending on like if they they, they bond with someone who's already got a lover. I, I don't know. This seems like really risky. I wouldn't want to play with that render that too much just now. Super size sensitive. You can now basically buy size sensitivity. And I'm pretty sure this can stack with other size sensitivity bonuses, so you can increase it even higher. This is yeah, that's kind of crazy. You can also get turned pawn psychically deaf as well. So there's there's different things you can buy up there. Super clotting reduces bleeding wounds, so you, your people are far less likely to bleed out. Super fast wound healing means you heal from wounds four times faster. Super soldiers, here you come. Uh, you can also get slow wound healing, though I don't know why you'd want that. Super immunity jacks up your immunity gain speed by 50%. That is kind of huge. Um, also, all the way down to weak immunity and stuff like that. Then you've got your ability to spray acid, spray fire, or spray fire foam out of your mouth. Um... Yeah, that's a thing. And Animal War Call, I'll actually show a sample of that. But basically, it causes, in a blast radius around you, animals will come to help you out. It's like an animal insanity pulsar, but instead of going insane, they actually come along to help you and then go away after about a day. Now, this is all to do with sort of the, the sarcophage, you know, vampire thing. You can drain blood from people, you can do a bit of healing, you can bite them, you can jump far, you, then they have this... We'll do more on that later. But this is the whole xenotype thing, and it's kind of crazy, the amount of stuff. And this is not all of the stuff that's available, there's a little bit more. It says there's more than 200 genes, but honestly, most of the stuff is pretty meh. Like, I mean, like, there's four here for each trait, so... I wouldn't say there's 200, but there's at least 50 or 60 you would really like to play around with. I know I'm throwing a lot of info at you, but yeah, there's a lot that's going on here with this uh, genes thing. The next bit we really need to cover, though, is germline genes versus xenogenes. This may look the same. Like, for example, this one here has xenogenes and all of its traits are down here and its germline genes are tiny. The reason for that is these ones up here are inheritable. As in, if you get, say, two of these dirt mole people and you get them to have a kid, the resulting kid will have all the same genes as their parents. Well, they'll, they'll, be, a, they'll be a dirt mole. So if you get two dirt mole gene lines, breed them together, they will have dirt mole gene line germline kids, so they'll have all the same traits. However, these hussars here, they don't have any genetics on them. All this stuff was spliced onto them after they were born. So if you take two hussars, get them to have a kid, the kid will be a baseline kid. All of these xenogenes will disappear. They do not carry over onto their children. So this stuff was all pasted onto them after they were born. So the thing to remember is several of these, like the dirt moles, the neanderthals, the pigskins, the impids, the wasters, uh, the Yatkins, all of those, their genes actually pass on to the like, pass on to the next generation. But say the high mates, uh, the Osars and the genies, those ones, they've all got. They're all just made from xenogenes, meaning their next generation will just be straight up normal humans. That's kind of important for the next bit. Please excuse the mess. This is just something I was playing around with to see how everything worked. Now, uh, say I save here. They are a female, and if we want them to reproduce, what we could do is just, well, wait till they pair off with someone and they can have a kid. Or, if you want to be a little bit more clinical about things, what you can do is you can extract an ovum from them. Now, this is a medical procedure, requires medicine, and the success chance is that it's multiplied by 500%, so very high success chance rate. So, someone will come along, and they'll grab out an ovum, and that's what one looks like. Now, the ovums basically have no genetics or anything of their own, but what you can do is you can combine their... Combine that with someone else. For example, we can just get a male, click on fertilize, and they'll go fertilize it. But not, not just yet. See, what we have here is a pawn who's an impid. It's their xenotype is basically they can spew fire, they have weak immunity, slow f wound healing, and fast runners. They're basically a, they're the worst enemies to have. They they can run fast, they can spew fire, and they can hurt you pretty much with their range weaponry quite decently. Their melee damage is terrible. But they've got weak immunity and slow wound healing, so you don't want to ever run these guys because they suck in it for you to play, but they're great for the enemy because they can just throw waves of cheap units at you that are very fast and can cause you horrible problems with their fire spewing. I'm going to hate fighting these, I just know it. But the thing is, if you... This is their... Uh, this here is their ovum. What we can do is we can combine this in a multitude of ways. For example, I've already combined it with Coyote. Coyote is also... Uh, Coyote is a waster, as in... Or the wasteland, whatever. They basically have toxic immunity, wake up, psychite dependency, all of this stuff. So if we combine the two of them together, 
it actually gives us this, which is basically a weak sauce version of them. They've still got the fire spewing, uh, they've still got the weak immunity, but they've lost the fast movement speed, uh, they have lost some of the melee damage negatives and stuff like that, but they've picked up pollution stimulus from Coyote's germline, so you end up with a sort of a cross mix, but its complexity tends to be much lower. As in, the amount of actual genes here has been much lower, because Coyote has a complexity of 13, uh, I save has a complexity of 11, but the resulting kid only has a complexity of 5, so it seems to simplify as it goes down, though I can't be sure. But if we get, uh, say, I save and we combine them with Blitz, Blitz is another germline of Impid, and the two of them together, they produce a kid that has, well, the exact same genes. As in, it's the same fast runner, it's got the slow healing. In other words, the traits breed true. If you have the same xenotypes bred together or gene germline genes bred together, they will produce identical offspring. It's only when you start combining that things get a bit more random. For example, we'll get Coyote here to fertilize this. And yes, the animation is, yep, kind of hilarious, but they've done it. And then if we get them out of the way for the second and click on this, we can see that it's different from the last one. So every time you combine them, you get a different mix. This one has cold resistance, which I presume it's getting from the fo Actually, wait, what? No, cold weakness comes from... I don't even know where that one comes from. Okay, they've now got mini horns, and it's changed it up. So if you're combining two different races together, you can end up with different kids, and the complexity seems to be a little bit more random. Okay then, that's interesting to know. But if you want to, say, pick people out, combine them together, and then you can what you can do is you can, say, get these embryos and implant them into a human, as in put them into iSave to actually be brought to term, or you can insert them into a growth vat to grow them outside of that, depending on which is more convenient for you. However, there is far more to it than that. This here is a gene assembler. What you do is you collect genes, you stick them into gene banks, and then when you do, you can engineer your own xenosplices. And by xenosplices, I mean they splice on under this section, under the bottom one, under his exogenes. So you could take this pawn here, who's got these germline genes, and then splice on more genes on top of it to make them into a different type of uh, pawn. So let's grab one I made earlier. This here is CAC. Um, they have fire spewing. They're basically one of those imp types. Uh, yep, yeah. but then what we've done is we've spliced on a bunch of xenogenes on top of that. So we've taken these traits that they've already had and then spliced on a bunch of other traits on top of them. And their complexity is up to 25. Their hunger rate's a bit off the charts, but eh, whatever, you know, it's fine. Um, it happens. The way you do that, though, is you have to collect a whole bunch of genes. And you can do that in a couple of ways. One is you can say call in combat suppliers or exotic goods traders. These can stock gene packs which you can buy. For example, there's a gaunt head gene which is great. Down here we've got Tox Immunity, so you can buy both of those, and they're relatively cheap. So you're looking at about four or five hundred, depending on what your uh, your level of skill with social is. Uh, you can also buy these Archite Capsules. They're the only they're the only traders that stock the Archite Capsules, and I'm not sure about the Death Rest, Serum, Death Rest Serums, but Archite Capsules are important. I'll get back to those in a minute. You can also sell embryos, but it's only worth 26 bucks, and honestly it's not worth the cost in medicine of making them, so yeah, selling embryos is not a good way to make money. Anyway, you can buy gene packs off these, or what you can do is get one of your pawns, say this one here is a Yatkin, or basically an animal uh, whisperer type thing, and we can tell them to enter the gene extractor over here. Uh, once they get in the gene extractor, what happens is it they sit in there for however long it takes, what is it, 24 hours? Uh, we'll dev finish that, and by the time it's finished, they drop out, and what they have is they've left this gene pack on the ground, and we randomly got animal war call, but the thing is you can get anything. That's the sort of the joy and hatred of it is, you could end up getting just brown hair, which is kind of pointless to you. Or you might get graded animals or awful at mining or one of these. Or you could get two combined. In fact, getting double combined stuff is very, very common. Uh, then what they do is they stick that into these gene banks. These gene banks hold the stuff. And someone there is going to grab it and dump it in. And they hold it and keep them safe. And as well as that, you can see those white lines going from these to this uh, device over here. They need to be in range of that. And so long as they're in range of that, and it's quite a long range they're able to feed those genes into this so you can combine genes. Now, you're not going to waste anything. You can make multiple genes. If you've only got, say, access to one sanguine in there, you can use it as many times as you want to make as many selected gene packs, and you can stack this stuff up as much as you like. Well, not quite. There's this complexity ranking down here of 8 of 20. Um, as you can see here, we've got these gene processors. They increase it. So if you don't have enough gene processors, you can only make a certain combination. For example, we can go up to complexity 12 right now. Every time we add on one of those, though, one of these uh, gene processors, for example, now it's up to 14. So each one of those adds plus two, meaning you can just keep adding those on again and again and again until you need as much to get up to the level of complexity you want. Problem will be getting your hands on those genes, though. Uh, for example, Bly here, we just put through that gene extraction. It takes four days before they recover from the negatives of it, which is 
pain, moving, consciousness, and blood filtration, and 25 days before their body recovers enough that it can be done a second time. If you try to do it a second time before their genes have finished your going in 25 days, they die. So, yeah. Uh, prisoners, I suppose, you can get two doses out of them before they're no longer prisoners. Now, that covers most of this, but this does leave you in an interesting position. You can basically splice really nice stuff onto your pawns at any particular time, so long as you've got the genes for it, which will take you a while to accumulate. No, no joking there, you're going to have to go through a lot of traders, trade at a lot of places, but eventually you'll get up a good gene bank. And then you could say take a shooting specialist. You say this pawn was a shooting specialist who's good at shooting, and then all the rest of this would be great at. They wouldn't be able to do construction, melee, mining, cooking, plants, animals, or crafting, because all of those negatives, the, the shooting specialist wouldn't allow them to do that. Then what you could do is make a custom xenotype or gene type for them, give them negatives in, well, all the stuff they can't do, like melee, crafting, cooking, you know, mining, all that stuff that they can't do anyway, and then give them huge bonuses in toughness, uh, healing, all sorts of stuff, and turn them into a super soldier in a many ways, shape, or form, and you can just splice it onto them. And then you can custom build that for each pawn. You've got a pawn that's great at cooking and farming, but that's it. Give them negatives in everything else. Well, this is just theory crafting here, but I can imagine this is, as you get more and more genes to play around with, you can custom build your pawns and splice genes on top of them to make them better. What you can't do right now, though, is you can't change their germline genes once they're born. Or, it, well, yeah, once you've started the game, their germline genes are locked in. You can't do anything about that. You can only change their exogenes. So I don't know how much of a difference that makes, but we'll have to see as the game progresses. But that still leaves two pawns that we haven't played around with yet, and that is the Mechantor. Uh, we've got Kak over here who's a Mechantor. You don't have to start with a Mechantor, though. What you can do is wait for a quest to appear. The two quest lines are the Mechantor ship. Uh, yeah, it can have points depending on how far along in the game you are. And the other quest is, uh, yeah, the vampire ship. Same thing again, it can have points. And then you can accept those quests, and what will happen is the craft will no, okay, accept that, and that's going to crash somewhere. And then all we have to do is go find this and kill the stuff that's in it. You'll see here, it pops out a bunch of enemies that are going to defend it. And then at the end, it pops out this corpse. So what you have to do is defeat these. And once these are defeated, the, gum, uh, the links, link will become available. And all you do is get a pawn to come up here and actually extract the link from out of the corpse. Extraction procedure is pretty quick. Then once it's done, you get this mech link. And then basically you can install that into a pawn, a bit like a psi link. And then once they've got a mech link, they can start m controlling robots. Things from there on in get interesting. You see, once you've got a mech link, there's not much you can do with it unless you do some research. Uh, research here is over this section, standard mech tech. Uh, to unlock it, you need to have access to basic mech tech. But basic mech tech gives you access to an air wired headset and a bunch of other random junk, but it allows you to get some of the very basic mechs. But if you want to go to the next level, which is standard mech tech or high mech tech or ultra mech tech, you'll see the zero of one thing. This is all to do with boss fights. Yep. What you can do is you can select the pawn and you can go down here under summon mech threat. And the first thing you'll be able to summon, I believe, is Diablos, or maybe it's War Queen or one of them. Once you summon that mech and kill it, it will give you a chip. That chip will allow you to do the research for this tech here, which will give you access to another technology, which will be the mech band antenna. The mech band antenna will allow you to summon the next boss. And that's, I think, the War Queen. Once you've summoned the War Queen, that will give, when she, she will drop a chip that will allow you to research high mech tech, that will give you access to a, a mech band dish, which allows you to summon the next boss. And that boss, when you kill them, will drop uh, a chip, the, was it, the nano structure chain chip, which will allow you to research the next tech, which gives you access to the mech lord helmet, mech suit, and a bunch of other things. Basically, you get stronger and better mechs the further along the tree you go. As well as that, you also get access to these headsets. Uh, where is it? I've got them over here. You've got the normal headset, which increases your mech bandwidth by three. This increases your mech bandwidth by six. And I think the next one increases it by nine. But what that does is it increases this bandwidth down here. You only start with about five or six bandwidth, so it's actually a pretty decent gain. The smaller robots, like these lifter ones, that's basically a hauling bot. That costs you one. I think the bigger ones cost about two. The centipedes cost about four or five. And the really big ones, like you can have the series of War Queen. Uh, you can release, you can get them to release a swarm of war urchins to, for you, which honestly they seem kind of terrible. But you do get this Diablos drone, but which is kind of cool. It's got this uh, Inferno cannon thing that uh, takes a while to warm up, but when it does, it basically vaporizes everything in a larger radius. And it even works against other mechs. I shot a centipede with it and it knocked off, yeah, about a uh, hundred health or something. Or, yeah, I think it knocked off a hundred and something. Some of it's been healed since then. But yes. This thing can actually damage other mechs with a flame-based weapon. I did not think that was possible, but I think it's the explosive damage at the start. Good for destroying walls, but honestly, I'm kind of underwhelmed by the mech tech. Um, 
you can get access to centipedes and stuff like that, and then you can draft them and use them as normal. They've even put, uh, you can get miniguns, orb charge blasters, or infernal cannons on them. You're not going to want infernal cannons, honestly. What you're really going to want here is probably lots of heavy centipedes to soak damage. Give them some blasters, that's good. The other option I see, considering you can get 30 bandwidth late game, and you can even increase that further by putting on these band nodes, I would probably get a load of constructors, haulers, things like that. You could run your base entirely with one Mechantor. They are just incredibly resource efficient in terms of that. Though I don't know how much this increases your raid difficulty. So uh, raid scaling, I don't know how it's been done. But I think the most the most valuable thing I'd see from this is actually just running a, 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 just a whole bunch of drones to run your base. And you can have them doing all your labor. And then all of your pawns can be genetically engineered killing machines that suck at labor. If you want. Uh, except for maybe a few crafters. However... To make these mechs, you've got to craft them in these types of machines. So you can craft smaller ones, like the smaller ones get crafted in this. So you can make most of your little crafters, your farmers, your sweepers, your haulers, your fabricators, all this sort of stuff, and a few little small fighter drones. Uh, however, this thing produces this waste, uh, toxic waste packs. Now you're going to have to play around with this some more, but as that decays, it, it basically pollutes the environment. This causes you more problems. It'll cause your pawns to get sick. There's lots of negatives, but you could genetically engineer your way around it, or you can, say, put all the waste into transport pods and fire them at people. Your call. Um, there's also a new power thing introduced, which I'm a little bit confused about. For example, this is a Toxify generator. Uh, it generates 1,400 watts of power, can be placed anywhere, and what it does is it pollutes everything in a radius that large. It slowly starts polluting things. Same way you can uh, put down a moisture pump, this thing does the same thing, but for the ground, by pumping out all the goodness and turning it all into pollution. It'll slowly expand out and generate power as it does so. Now, the length of time it takes, uh, that varies, but I'm assuming it'll take a while. But this might be a nice way to pollute the entire map if you want, to make it really nasty for your enemies when they show up. Because you could just genetically engineer yourself to survive with it. There's there's options there. But the, the mechs thing, I really don't see. Like, I think the one I like the most is... Ah, Legionnaire 1. These are relatively small, relatively efficient bots for their cost. They come with a shield, a 200 point shield, and they come with a needle gun. Basically, they're a pikeman with a shield. And they have a movement speed of ah, 4.95 when they're in range of a booster. Uh, their normal base speed is about 4.3. So they move at the same speed as a pawn, have a needle gun, which has massive range, have some shields. So you could stack them up and do some fun damage, and you're fast enough that you can kite most things. Well, most things that don't have any speed bonuses. There's a few races that do now. Those ones I'm interested in because you could stack a lot of them up and they would add a significant amount of firepower. Uh, the Diablos guy, yeah, interesting, but uh, maybe only good against certain things. These at least would still be good against mechs. Their, their armor penetration is pretty good. Or centipedes just for this year, tank value. Now that leaves one final thing, which is the vampires. These are super interesting. They're basically done the same way as this mech quest, except the vampire lands alive with their retinue and you have to capture them alive. Which shouldn't be too hard. Shock glance to take them out or you could just shoot them until they go down. Reason being is, these vampires, they pretty much work on the genetics thing, except they've got a bunch of fun ones. For example, they are ageless. They just don't die. They stop aging at the age of 18. Uh, they are deathless. I mean, the only way to destroy them is to destroy the brain. They're pretty much like zombies in that way. you got to kill the brain, otherwise they don't go down. They can recover from pretty much anything, it seems. Though I haven't put that to the test. Uh, non senes whatever. I can't pronounce that. They can't get cancers, heart attacks, bad backs, frail. Disease stuff, or aging stuff doesn't bother them. Uh, they have a metabolism that increases efficient metabolism. That's not really a big thing, but are immune to all diseases. Flu, malaria, sleeping sickness, plague, infection, and lung rot. If I'm reading that right, that means they can't even get an infection from a wound. Scarless. All their scars will disappear over time. Never have to worry about scars. That's kind of awesome sauce. They've got a bunch of other things. They're toxic immunity. They're robust. They're fast runners by default. Uh, they're size sensitive, super fast wound healing. Um, they're pretty. Uh, low sleep requirements, they have strong melee, uh, strong social, strong intellectual. They're pretty much generally all around awesome, except for a few glaring weaknesses. Tinder skin, quad damage from fire, and being anywhere near fire can cause them to have mental breaks. And uh, they also get a bunch of abilities in here that are powered by blood. So it's, it's called hemoglobin in this. Hemogen? Yep. They have long jump, which allows them to jump a decent distance getting close to prey. Uh, they can feed off friendly people. They can't just feed off enemies. You could probably feed off slaves and prisoners, though. This uh, gives them about 20... Like I think this gives them about 20 hemoglobin, the way it's phrased. And people, by default, have 100. So you can feed on people, take some blood, and leave them alive afterwards. This piercing spine I haven't played around with. Basically, it's a projectile weapon, short range. Coagulate allows them to um, detend to someone's wounds. And they do get a bonus to... Did they get a bonus to their medical? No, they don't. Uh, also, they have implant genes. This basically allows them to convert someone over to being a vampire. It basically turns, it gives someone all of these stats. You jab someone with that, their entire xenogeome, uh, xeno genes are overwritten with the vampire ones, and they become basically a vampire with all the strengths and weaknesses that come with it. 
However, I saw this and I thought, wow, this is amazing. Getting your pawns this way would be great. You'd have to worry about fire, fire stuff. But until I went a little bit deeper into the Gene Assembler, you see, the Gene Assembler can also find these abilities, like they get super immunity, uh, non sessiant whatever, the one that gets rid of all the carcinomas, heart attacks, bad back, frail, all that stuff, gone. Gene Implanter. You can get a Gene Implanter for your pawns. This is really, really interesting in a way. Also, perfect immunity, size sensitivity. Now, do note, these things are special. Uh, for example, let's just say I take this one. This one only costs uh, minus two. This is giving us a minus two on our... It's costing us two points, which is seems kind of cheap, but it's actually the size sensitivity is costing anything. The perfect immunity isn't costing us anything. That requires an archite capsule. Remember those archite capsules I mentioned you can buy from exotic goods traders? So this perfect immunity, this non sessient this super immunity, this gene implanter, all of those things don't cost any points. They cost archite capsules, which you have to buy, and then you have to pay the cost when you're installing them. So it actually costs money to install them, but they don't actually negatively affect you in any way. So these are all just bonuses you can stack on top of your pawns. It's kind of insane. So if we take CAC here, they have been uh, given a bunch of stuff, including the gene implanter. So what this allows them to do is CAC here can just go, hey, would anyone like else like to have all of my genes? And they can just jab someone with this. However, they can only do it once every 25 days. It takes that much time for their genes to recover. But it does mean you can pass this on. Or you can just craft more genes out of this assembler. The gene assembling thing just seems so incredibly overpowered that I don't see the vampires having much of a place once you get to late game. Once you've got a big enough gene bank, the vampires become less uh, important. They do have a bunch of stuff they can get, though, like that goes on top of that. Though I haven't played around with this too much. Uh, this allows them to get... It it's, hooks up to the, the caskets. And they have to go into this death sleep every so often. And when they do, if you have a bunch of these around, they give bonuses to it. Now, I haven't played too much with all of these, but the best I can figure, this is a death rest accelerator, meaning it accelerates their sleep. This one here is a psychoid fluid pump. What it does is give them a, a bonus when they wake up, where they have plus five meditation. It increases their psychic abilities, basically, to make them even stronger. Uh, then you've got this glucozoid pump, and this seems to give them a movement speed bonus that should, I presume, be permanent when they wake up until they go back to sleep again, so they'd constantly just be moving faster all the time. Kind of huge, to be honest. Uh, this is hemoglobin amplified. It in increases their hemoglobin gain, so they might be able to suck more blood out of people for less cost. And then a hemo pump, which uh, it basically it, it increases the amount of hemoglobin they can store in their body. So instead of being able to score 100 hemoglobin, they'll be able to store more. Now, there seems to be some death rest limit on a, a pawn. So we'll have a look at this one over here. They seem to be only able to... Uh, ah. They can only link to a certain amount of these things, and to link to more of them, they have to consume these death rest caskets. Uh, you can buy them off uh, exotic goods traders, so it doesn't seem to be that much of a problem. But as far as I can see, they seem pretty weak, but I'm open to being proven wrong on that. I would like to play around with these some more. But, long story short, this gene stuff, yes, there's going to be so much playing around and so many fun races and combinations you can do. Going to be incredible. The robot stuff, yes, you can now have centipedes fighting for you. That's incredibly powerful. And the pollution, it seems there's ways around it so far. And there's even an end game tech that costs about oh, an enormous amount of resources. But it allows you to incinerate. Yeah, waste pack atomizer. Costs 8,000 points by default. 16,000 if you're playing on tribal because of the uh, the research negative. But yeah, you can ev effectively atomize this stuff. Though you do need a nano structure chip, which means you've got to do a, a second boss fight again to get access to that nano structure chip. And it costs a lot of power. It's probably just going to be easier to dump that waste on someone's doorstep. Or send it at their base for fun. Who knows? Oh, children. Yes, uh, the children you get in this. You can grow the children up, but as they're aging, what you're going to want to do is give them play pens and stuff. There's a whole furniture section under here with baby decorations, toy boxes, blackboards. But so long as their needs are met very well, what you'll do is you'll get options as they're growing up to give them traits. So you can give them the traits of maybe... Maybe you'll get the options to give them tough or, you know, fast learner or stuff like that. Or you might get terrible options, like the less... The less uh, the less well raised they are, the less options you're going to get on every pick. So you might be stuck with either slow poke and slow learner, pick one. <laughs> yeah, so both bad choices. Or you might get five or six choices because they've got more. I'm, I haven't done too much research into it, but from what I can see, the better you raise the kids, the more options you get to cram good traits on top of them. So you could make them tough um, and give them a bunch of other traits on top of that. And tough stacks up with some of the other traits you can get, like, where is it? Ah, robust. So you could have a tough, robust pawn, which would just be incredibly impossible to down. There's lots of fun ways you can combine all this together, so yes, I'm very much looking forward to it. Oh, and this guy has, uh, was it Animal Call? Uh, is there any animals around that we can maybe get to call on? Oh wait, there's the Muffalo. Let's go over and see if we can't get those convince those Muffalos to join our team for a day. Here my call, animal brethren. Join our call. Wait, there is fine? What? How do I activate this? Oh, seriously? Oh, that's, that's not great, is it? You get one of them to join us? Uh, 
You can't even do anything with it. I thought that was going to affect multiple ones. You, uh, you can join us too. Uh, are you going to help out at all? Right, so basically it'll probably attack enemies. Okay, not nearly as powerful as I was hoping it to be. It only affects a single individual animal at a time, and only if they're big, so... Not really that great. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just realized I never showed you how to actually use this to assemble genes. For example, we've put together this gene pack, which is kind of fun in many ways. We've got non... whatever. You can't get cancer anymore, and you can't get heart attacks or any of the age-related illnesses. Also, you're super immune, so there's literally, you, you know, plus 150% to your immunity gain. And then we stuck in mild cell instability on top of that to help counteract some stuff. And this has helped us buy us some space. Uh, also, there's super fast wound healing, so we heal four times faster. Super clotting, uh, sanguine, awful lot of plants and animals, sterile. But you this short hair here is actually linked to the super fa fast wound healing. So all of our pawns that get this gene pack will have short hair. It's just a, it's one of those nice ways they're going to add personality to everything, I think. Anyway, we can start combining these and it gives you a, an estimated time. The more complex it is, the more time it's going to take. But... You want to go pretty big before it takes longer than 24 hours. Let's just dev finish that immediately. And there you go. It's going to look like this weird thing that you clamp onto someone's spine. Anyway, then you want to pick out a pawn. So let's see. Like, see this genie here? This genie is a genetically engineered crafter. They get bonuses towards crafting. They're awful at social. They're great intellectual. Like, they've got all these things. But you'll notice these are exogenes. This will overwrite all of that and replace it with these genes. Whereas, say, someone like... Ah, someone like Islev here, they're a imp, so they can breathe fire and all that. If we splice this onto them, all the xenogenes will go down here below. So let's just try this on, say, orange for now. Orange, I want you to... Yeah. Now, it'll actually warn you. Uh, they will have a met met metabolism value of minus one for food consumption. That's a, a multiplier, so they're going to be even hungrier after this. So they should hop into a bed, and some will come along and implant it on them in a second. It takes four medicine to implant the xenogerm, and this might take a minute. And also takes a fair amount of time. But once it's done, you'll see they're in a xenogerm germination coma. Basically, it's applying all of the stats, but their body has to rebuild itself, so it takes 1.5 days. As well as that, their genes are regrowing, so it's 2.2 years before you'll be able to stick them in a gene extractor to extract any of the genes out of them. Also, if you've given them the sticker thing that allows them to implant genes, they can't use that for 2.2 years either. Uh, let's just uh, fast forward time a bit by going yoink, yoink. And now they can get up and about. And if we check on their genes now, you notice all the genes they used to have are all gone. It's all been replaced with this new one. Oh, one thing to note. This non sessient thing, this seems incredibly broken. Uh, you're immune to carcinomas. So what you can do is you can overstack your pawn, make them incredibly hungry, and then stick in a nuclear stomach. Nuclear stomachs reduce uh, your hunger rate by to 25%, or they divide it by four, basically. So you could double your hunger rate, then divide it by four, so you're only eating, what, a, quarter, a half as much as normal? Or you can increase even more. So nuclear stomachs, I think, are going to make a big comeback. So I think that's only from royalty DLC. Anyway, I've, been, I've been yakking too much about this. What I can see, yes, this is awesome. It has some great stuff. The most exciting bit for me is the gene assembling. The Macantor and the Vampire are pretty much, eh, they, they have some fun things I'd like to play around with, but I'm more excited about playing around with all the gene line stuff. Anyway. Uh, I've cut. I've already got an idea for the next series already done up. Episode should be out Monday. I uh, hope you enjoy this sort of brief look through and uh, good luck. First up, we have the low shield pop. There has been some changes to it, which have made it r much, much weaker. It used to be if you fired a doomsday at a low shield, it would instantly get absorbed by the outer shield and nothing bad could happen to you. Uh, unfortunately, that is no longer the case. Now, when it hits the shield, it instantly detonates at the point of impact. Uh, this seems not terrible, except if you're inside the shield. Yeah, you need to be standing at the very back to avoid getting caught in the blast, and even then, it's not going to save you. Now, the regular skip shield you get from actual sidecast abilities, that one still works the exact same way and will happily absorb a doomsday shot. It basically skips the projectile into another dimension or something, so... Oh, wait, no, they fixed that too. Finally, how this will also affect you is centipedes blasts, they, the inferno cannon ones, they will also leave a... It will also detonate on the edge, meaning if you have anyone standing near the edge, the blast is going to actually pass through and you're going to end up with fire on the ground inside your shield. So the low shield has now been nerfed quite heavily, and it seems skip shield as well. This is going to make things a little bit more dangerous. But on the bright side, if you hit a low shield with two doomsdays, the blast will go through enough and actually destroy the shield, from what I can tell. Actually, it might take two hits. Or maybe three. We'll see. But yeah, this is definitely going to change up defensively. One thing that has also been removed is a little exploit we've been using to wake up mechanoids. It used to be you could wake up sleeping mechanoids by just building a bunch of sleeping spots near them. That doesn't affect them anymore. Any zero construction work buildings that get placed near them don't count for waking up purpose purposes. 
this was just one of those little tricks that was nice. It used to be you could have someone punch an animal or a warg and they would become guilty, and this allows you to execute them without any consequences. Unfortunately, now punching an animal does not make your pawns guilty anymore, so that's one other exploit they've kind of patched out. 